Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IoT for All podcast. I'm Ryan Jacone, and on today's episode, we're going to be talking about the connectivity landscape in IoT, as well as best practices and carrier strategies in IoT. And joining me today will be Matt Hatton, one of the founding partners of Transform Insights. They are a leading research firm focused on the world of IoT, AI, and digital transformation. Matt has been here before. He's a fantastic guest that I think we'll get a lot of value out of listening again to today. Before we get into this episode, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already, and hit that bell icon so you get the latest episodes as soon as they are out. Other than that, let's get on to the episode. Welcome, Matt, to the IoT for All podcast. Thanks for being here again. Thanks, Ryan. My pleasure. Always. Yeah, it's, it's great to have you back. A lot of exciting stuff I know we want to cover today. But just for our audience's sake who um, may not be be familiar um, or, or know, knew, know you very well, it'd be great if you could just give a quick overview, uh, background kind of experience about yourself, quick introduction about um, not just yourself, but also Transform Insights. Yeah, happy to do that. I've been a technology industry analyst for, I think, now 25 and a bit years. So nice. uh, that's a terrifying thing when I when I think <laughs> about it. Uh, yeah, I've been a, a technology industry watcher uh, for quite a long time, uh, kicking off really looking at the telecom space. So I'm a, I'm a telecoms guy. My master's was telecoms. I did actually work a little bit for a mobile operator as well. So okay. not just been an analyst, uh, but that's been the vast majority of, of what I've done. The last dozen or so years have been focused on IoT, and that's ostensibly what my current company does. So Transform Insights is an industry analyst firm focused on IoT and actually, in fact, the wider digital transformation landscape. So we look at a, a set of other technologies that sit adjacent to IoT as well, things like AI and blockchain, and look at how those technologies also have a role to play for enterprises in right. uh, digitally transforming, shall we say. But I think predominantly, probably 80, 90 percent of what we do is focused on IoT. And that's, okay. that's my, my sweet spot and always has been. Fantastic. Yeah, we, we're big fans of what you all do. Um, I know we've been in contact. You've been on the podcast before, but uh, the work you all put out is is fantastic and a huge value for the industry. So it's, I'm glad to have you have you back on. I know we wanted to talk about um, kind of the annual commun- communications um, service provider IoT ben- peer benchmarking that you just put out. But um, before we do that, I wanted to ask if just at a high level, I wanted to talk about the connectivity landscape since mm-hmm. that will kind of connect to that part of the conversation. But if if you were to talk to somebody and in you know maybe newish to the industry and just kind of trying to get caught up with what the current IoT connectivity landscape looks like how would you kind of explain it to them or talk them through it well the landscape very much depends on what you're trying to do obviously i mean that's a, that's a given one of the difficult things with being an analyst is that the answer to almost every other question if not every question is it depends you know, it depends what you're trying to do it depends what you're trying to connect so there's a whole lot of the IoT landscape, which is really focused on just short range connectivity. There's a whole load of mm. consumer devices which connect using Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and and, and, and so on. That's probably 70% of the, the market. Uh, but there's also a, a, b- a big chunk which is around uh, connecting wide area. Uh, so that's it might be smart meters or it might be connected cars or it could be sure. uh, fleet management or various tracking devices or, or whatever. Uh, and so that, uh, that's another part of the market running on public networks. And there's a huge amount of interesting stuff going on there. And in fact, there's some really interesting stuff that's happening that's, that's kind of bridging the gap between those two. So mm-hmm. using cellular technologies, but in a private deployment. So there's mobile mm-hmm. private networks. We published a report uh, September last year, I think, something like that, looking at this MPN private wireless uh, landscape. So uh, using 4G and 5G networks for connecting internally within factories and warehouses and those kinds of things. So that's one of the interesting trends that's that's happening. Uh, There's also a lot of stuff going on with the wide area networking itself. We've got Mm -hmm. new, well, not exactly new now, but um, increasingly mature, shall we say, uh, low power wide area technologies, things like LTEM and MBIOT, and uh, on the unlicensed side of things, LoRaWAN being used uh, a lot more for uh, connecting well, more sensors, low power devices, things that run on batteries, yeah. that kind of stuff. So there's some interesting stuff going on there. So that's the kind of broad brush view of what the technologies are, what they're doing. Ooh, one other thing to mention satellite. Now, satellites yeah. always been used a fair amount in 
in IoT. Well, I say a fair amount. It's probably 1% of connections and certainly no more of that than that. But it's very useful for certain use cases in, in, in certain, uh, certain scenarios. Uh, but there's been quite a lot of interest from adopters, potential adopters, uh, on the uh, low Earth orbit satellites, the LEO right. satellites, which are um, poised to be launched and potentially, in fact, some some already have been launched, but there's a lot of um, potential uh, deployers of said uh, constellations. And, and that looks interesting. Do we think it's going to be a huge part of the market? Not really, uh, okay. because the vast majority of IoT connections are still going to be in places where there's access to some either private or, or public network. But sure. It's it's also interesting and it's part of the uh, it's part of the ecosystem. It's part of the the, the yeah. connectivity landscape. Yeah, I've actually had a lot of conversations recently with with nano satellite companies, and these a lot of them seem to be pretty pretty early on, just trying to get satellites out into orbit and you know figure out how they're going to fit in. But I wanted to ask you, since you mentioned satellite, is the combination of using satellite connectivity, pairing that with things like LoRaWAN or other Kind of terrestrial connectivity options. How, how have you seen that kind of, or what are your, I guess, thoughts on that um, and, and how that could potentially provide value or maybe not as much value as people think uh, for the IoT space? Oh, I think pretty much everything is going to be multi-mode. Yeah. Uh, the, the reliability and availability of satellite is obviously very good if you've got, typically if you've got line of sight, but in many cases you don't have line of sight, but it's going to be pretty slow. It's going to have uh, higher latency, so it's going to take a lot longer for the for the packets to be delivered. Almost certainly, mm -hmm. it's almost certainly also going to be more of a a battery drain on on the devices. So in most cases, we'd expect any given satellite device, or connected satellite device, using those technologies, uh, so predominantly LoRaWAN and and MBIoT, uh, to be multi-mode. And we've got. A, a plethora of those multi-mode uh, devices available. In fact, increasingly, you won't even be able to tell the difference other than mm -hmm. uh, potentially uh, in the context of uh, the, a slightly bigger antenna or something like that, but mostly it's it's pretty much the same uh, device. Right. Okay, yeah, I was just kind of curious to get your thoughts on that. Um, I wanted to jump into kind of what I mentioned when we started this conversation is your annual communication service provider IoT peer benchmarking that you just put out. Can you kind of kick us off by just telling us a little bit about what that is, what it means, and kind of the purpose of doing it? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we've been doing over the course of, well, the whole of the time at Transformer Insights is looking at network operators, both the mobile network operators and the MVNOs, the virtual network operators in the IoT landscape and looking at uh, what their capabilities are, what their strategies are, what their approaches to the market are. And let me take a little little step back. There's, there's quite a few sure. changes going on in the, in the space at the moment. So you've got um, a, a topic that we've been looking at a, a fair amount in the last few months is, is around a taxonomy uh, for IoT, a new new taxonomy for IoT. So let me talk talk a little bit about that first, and then I'll get on yeah, to the, 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 the benchmarking. Uh, and the idea there is um, maybe we've been getting this a little bit wrong over the years in terms of thinking about how the um, how the services are provided and who provides those, or maybe not wrong, but things have evolved a little bit. Uh, so we tend to think now of of there being a set of service domains that are separate from who runs networks and, and who sells you a, a device. There's a set of service domains which are around the management of the connectivity, the management of the devices, the provision of security, the uh, contextualization even of the of the services as they're uh, being offered to the to the customer. Context is very important. You you can't just sell a completely horizontal to solution to, to somebody. What what's become increasingly apparent is you need to be able to talk the language of the companies that are that are deploying this stuff in order for them to to get it to to understand and also to to smooth their deployment of these these IoT uh, technologies uh, so that that context layer is is very important as well so you kind of got these service domains that 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 are the the, the key ones in IoT so when we come to do our annual benchmarking of of the capabilities of all of these these various players, that's what we've got in mind. We're thinking, okay. how how capable are these companies in uh, pulling together both a connectivity 
offering and that includes things like how you deal with multi-country deployments are you using eSIM or roaming have you got some right. other special kind of, of mechanism for supporting devices in, in multiple countries also what are your your capabilities and and um and, and skills in in things like uh, your connectivity management platform or how you deal with um how your data flows are are managed to mm -hmm. to ensure that you get lowest latency you have local breakout you have you know all of these things to to consider compliance is another another critical one uh, so we were looking at all, all of these things in the in the context of okay core connectivity how, how do you how do you do your, your your connectivity how do you provide connectivity what are the capabilities there and then also as a sort of second dimension to it what kind of capabilities have you got in the other areas that sit adjacent to these these uh, uh, IOT connectivity capabilities, so things around security and compliance, and as I mentioned, contextualization and devices and a whole load of other other areas like that. Uh, so that gives us a really interesting uh, framework for thinking about who's doing what and where. And, and what comes out of the, the research is really is two things. Okay, One is we've just spent the best part of probably getting on for six months, I, I guess, from, from the very start to, to the very finish, talking to uh, all of the great and the good of the, of the network operator community, the providers of this IoT connectivity. And when you do that, you, you get a feel for what are the key trends, what are the interesting things that are happening in the space. Uh, and right. that's one of the things that we, we boil down in the, in the report to give the uh, providers a, a view on what's happening in your in, in your landscape i'm sure they're aware yeah. of quite a lot of it but just our, our take on what those those key themes are the yeah. other thing is uh, of course we're able to then compare and contrast the capabilities of all the various operators and then look at who do we think is best it's yeah. i have to be a little bit careful with that though because of course of is. course we're in the same boat we have to be yeah we're not yeah we don't we try not to play favorites but we try to guide people in the right direction for sure well, we're, we're happy to put a stake in the ground. The The problem with, with doing those kinds of, of things, and we do do them, right? We do put yeah, a stake in the ground and say, okay, we, we rate these companies at the highest yeah. and, and, and so on. Right. But it, but it is pretty reductive. Um, you're taking something which is, which is a complex uh, topic and then you're trying to boil it down to a, a score out of 10 or a place on a two by two matrix or, or whatever. And mm -hmm. our, our message is always with this stuff. A again, who's the best? Well, it depends. It depends on right. all sorts of things. Predominantly, where do you want to deploy this stuff? You know, if, if what right. you're trying to do is connect a, a bunch of connected cars in uh, the Asia Pac region, well, you may well go talk to Singtel. If you want to connect smart meters in Sweden, you want to go talk to Telia. Uh, it may also depend on just things like who your cloud provider is and therefore the, the most seamless data integration. That, that kind of... Uh, determining factor may may actually be the be the be the key thing uh, so you, you try to or what we're trying to do is kind of boil all of that down into well who's doing the most interesting stuff and and therefore mm -hmm. who do we think that that buyers ought, ought to be looking at to understand okay well, what what capabilities have they got what kind of things should we be um would be, should we be looking for in our connectivity provider fantastic well and what are our without kind of divulging too much what what are some of the kind of findings trends key themes that you were able to pull from you know that six months of of research and, and engagement yeah uh how long have you got is is always the uh, <laughs> always the question at that point but there's 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 a whole lot of stuff so um one would be i mentioned about this this idea of provision of multi-country connectivity how do you support um, cellular based IoT connections. And that's what we're talking about here. When we talk about our communication service provider benchmarking, we're talking about providing cellular connectivity. Sure. Some of them also okay. do a bit around LoRaWAN and a few other things, but but predominantly this is cellular connectivity. And there's there's a very interesting dynamic happening with that at the moment where we're uh, kind of in a interregnum between um, the, the way things used to work, which was with you switch a SIM card out or you rely on roaming 
to an environment where there is a well established tried and tested set of mechanisms for localizing connectivity onto a local network be that with eSIM maybe iSIM remote SIM, uh, subscription management that that kind of thing or some more sophisticated mechanisms for handling roaming a sort of roaming plus type type approach and we're halfway through that process we're kind of in the in the dip at the moment whatever he works out okay how am i going to do this i've got multi mc sims i've got e sims i've got this uh, agreements with operators for uh, often re on a reciprocal basis for supporting my connections in in um in each other's territory you know th this stuff is is kind of playing out at, at the moment and and that's interesting to to watch uh, but it's still a little bit chaotic at the moment shall we shall we say Okay, um, very good. Second, yeah, no, keep going. Second theme being um, devices, the importance of devices. Now, this okay. might seem pretty obvious, really. IoT, <laughs> uh, an IoT connection needs a needs a device on the end of it. But increasingly, we see there's there's a need for uh, connectivity and devices to be uh, cross optimized or uh, provided together in 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 some way, which means that the hardware manufacturers are increasingly getting into the connectivity space there's a couple of hardware manufacturers or companies that are ostensibly hardware manufacturers who have uh, added on or continue to provide connectivity that are profiled in the report so we include sierra wireless and telit and then you have the likes of quectel who who don't feature but they're they're building sure. a, a connectivity offering around their uh, their devices as as well as we as we speak so they're getting in on the act but it's also got to happen from the other direction as well. The uh, companies that historically were providers of SIM cards, shall we say, uh, are also needing to look at the at the hardware space because, well, it's, there's a few reasons for it. One, you've got that benefit of cross optimizing all of the various things when you're dealing with constrained networks and you're dealing with uh, the use of protocols which need to work with the low power technologies and you've got uh, you want to optimize the application logic, all of the various different elements of an IoT proposition. You've got to get that to work uh, seamlessly together. And in order to do that, you want to make sure that the device works with the connectivity. That's one thing. Another one is the device manufacturers or the or the consideration of the device, the hardware piece, is often very early on in the in the process of uh, building that solution. And so if you're a network operator and you want to be considered early on in the process, rather than just an afterthought, it's very useful to be involved in that conversation early on about, about devices. Sure. And then the, the final one's eSIM. If okay. we're, we're likely to have pretty much every device or large volumes of devices shipping with some form of connectivity already baked in because they need a bootstrap. At MC, they need some bootstrap connectivity baked into the into the device. That's rather different from what happened before, where this was a unconnected terminal. You needed to put in a SIM card. So that kind of a dynamic means it, it, it kind of focuses the attention on, well, I want my connectivity to be the one that's in that device all, already. So there's a lot of, lot of dynamic, dynamics like, um, like that. Um, cloud native as well, or the, the importance of scalability, shall we, shall we say, actually. Um, we talked in the last iteration of the report about this concept of hyperscale IoT connectivity providers. So uh, setting yourself up to be able to cope with tens of millions, hundreds of millions of connected devices. Well, many operators are already at tens of tens or hundreds of millions, sure. but maybe 10x or 100x the number that you're, you're supporting today. Can you do that with on-premises platforms? Can you do that with... Uh, with a set of infrastructure which is uh, geographically specific well it's kind of challenging so we we see some really interesting stuff happening in terms of having um, cloud-based core networks cloud-based packet gateways having just having the infrastructure in place to to scale to well almost infinitely so that's one of the uh, the things that we look at a lot when we're considering who we think are going to be the, the the hot hot players, and then there's a there's a few other things. One I mentioned this contextualization idea, and and in fact that's bound up in this idea of a 
a service wrap, the requirement that actually all of this IoT stuff that's being sold is actually really needs to be uh, sold as a managed service with uh, some provision for holding the hand of the customer as they as they deploy uh, these solutions they they need they're not experts in the in, in the space and connectivity providers are never going to be infinitely scalable iot platform companies there has to be a, a services element to it as, as well and we we see that as being very important and we've we've seen that happen with um well, one of one of the interesting things that's cropped up actually in, in microcosm of that is um, we've seen a lot of focus on customer success managers, and I see this has been quite interesting. This is this is the term that's come up probably more in the course of the last six months than it ever ever has before. So this is people internally within the the operators right, who are responsible right. for making sure that that uh, the client is is supported in the in the most appropriate way, which kind of reflects that it changes the relationship has changed from being one about um uh, just a transaction i've sold you a sure. bunch of sim cards to one that's about an ongoing relationship and one way you need yeah. to really be thinking about the the context in which that company is deploying stuff and and, and really look after them so that's that's a few so a couple i could i could go on i've got a couple other ma macro level ones which are quite interesting as well if you if you game yeah let's let's hear it yeah absolutely okay. uh, so at a very high level obviously we look at network operators and we look at mvno so the network operators they run access networks in whichever uh, in a, a range of countries not not all countries they've all got their their own footprint but you know they they run access networks in in some countries and then you've got the mvnos that don't do that but they do have some mm. network elements they've got a, a core network typically and a and a bunch of uh, distributed net, network elements as as well but there's quite a difference in the approach between those those players we've got what i've described with the network operators as so, something like existential angst all right so they they're um they're really thinking a lot of them what's my role in iot what 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 am i doing i don't mean this in a in a negative way but like rethinking their approach to the to, to the space in quite a, a significant way and qu quite a few changes uh, at&t just just announced the other day that it was moving its iot it was consolidating its iot operations and putting it into its emerging businesses line of business mm -hmm. we've got uh, vodafone is looking some way at spinning out its it's uh it's iot operations um exactly what form that takes we shall we shall see but there's uh, there's certainly something interesting happening there and then other companies deutsche telecom has rearranged how it how it addresses iot a, a few years ago um and 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 there are a bunch of others there's there's some very interesting um dynamics happening there where they're trying to work out what they should be doing now right. from the mvno side of things now those guys are bullish should we say at the moment and there's a, there's a lot of dynamism happening in in that space at, at the moment partly as a result of this this trend which sees a lot of this uh the responsibility for iot move out of the what we've turned infrastructure domains into those service domains that i talked about earlier you know you can address most things in iot through these these software um service-based uh, domains and they are increasingly doing a lot of the the more innovative stuff we um we moved from last year we covered a dozen companies um of which two were mvnos and this mm. year we're covering 23 which uh, let me tell you doubling the size of the report was um quite uh uh, quite imagine. the endeavor, shall we say? But but of those twenty three, nine are MVNOs. So we we've okay. added significant numbers of uh, of MVNOs because they're doing a lot of the the more interesting uh, stuff. Sure. And sure. in fact, we've seen quite a lot of instances where the network operators are almost trying to channel the uh, the IoT energy, shall, shall we okay. say? this kind of being more nimble being more uh, agile and and, uh, and and software oriented e even to the point of so telefonica as a, as a for instance they launched an iot mvno in their own home territory of, of spain 
Uh, so you've got that kind of this very interesting uh, approach. And I, I think we'll see more of that kind of uh, dynamic going on in the next in the next year or, or two. And maybe even some consolidation. I can well see network operators buying up a few of these IoT MVNOs to to try and, and, and get a, a grip on some of that more uh, more nimble uh, approach to the market. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you what you thought about kind of consolidation because there's a lot of companies that I talk to and uh, we work with a lot of companies pretty closely uh, in the connectivity space, a lot of MVNOs and a lot of companies focus on this. And I just want to kind of, I'm trying to understand and get a better grasp on you know, how big is the, the, the opportunity for to fit how many companies within it? You know, at what point do you start to see consolidation, whether it's from acquisitions or companies not, not able to kind of getting a good foothold in the space, mm -hmm. but um, that's a very interesting kind of element to 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 kind of keep an eye on. Yeah, it, it is. It's fascinating. Now, on the network operator side of things, not at all. I mean, this is one right, two percent sure. of their revenue. They're never going to consolidate based on based on IP. Yep, uh, not 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 amongst themselves anyway. But we have seen. Uh, we've certainly seen on the MVNO side of things consolidation has happened uh, over the years uh, a, a tremendous amount so you look at core for instance so the heritage of core is that they were a roll up of uh, about half a dozen different iot mvnos and uh, wireless logic even more so uk based wireless logic they've been acquiring companies uh, since day one more or less and i think in the last two or three years they've they've added seven or eight probably operators to their to their roster and they they integrate them typically that's about geographical expansion but also some functionality expansion so this kind of stuff has always happened uh, i think sure. you know it's it, it's not a it's not particularly a new dynamic but i think we will see it uh, continue i think mm -hmm. uh, to an extent there's actually an environment which is rather more uh, receptive to those kinds of strategic acquisitions at the moment because uh, private equity money actually is maybe a little less interested in IoT connectivity companies than than they possibly were okay. two or three years ago, which means that well, those kinds of assets are priced priced more reasonably, sh shall we say, in terms of the multiples on on revenue. Right. And, and I think it, that that allows for a bit more strategic acquisition, and and, and we'll mm -hmm. see we'll see quite a bit of of that. Yeah. Do you? How do you kind of see the focus of a lot of these companies when it comes to trying to be more of a horizontal play, um, or focusing kind of on certain verticals and trying to be a bit more kind of niche themselves down a bit? to say you know we're connectivity focused in this on this industry as opposed to being mm. kind of something that that can be applied to or, or adopted for a variety of different industries and we've kind of seen that with platforms kind of trying to be a very horizontal play but then realizing well maybe we should specialize a bit more based on our solutions that we push around certain verticals that we're seeing foothold you know kind of traction in mm. are you kind of seeing a similar approach or are you do you have you seen kind of anything kind of connected to that in in, in the report and the work you've done Yes, it's certainly a topic that that comes up. The okay. idea of being a of going up the stack is sure. one that has come up over the years a, a lot. Th this idea that well, you know, seventy percent of the value of a, of an IoT uh, solution sits in the actual application that that rides over the top, whether it be fleet management right. or security or tracking or or whatever, right. and therefore isn't the obvious approach, isn't the logical approach for the network operators to go after that bit as well? Well, logical, but also wrong. Right. For the okay. simple reason that typically for any one of those applications, there will be a dozen more uh, companies that uh, already provide those types of solutions. And so what, what comes out from the network operator tends to be a me too. And we've seen that in connected home, we've seen it in healthcare, and we've seen it in a variety of different different verticals. It's very difficult to uh, stake a claim in a in a market. You know, what's the right to play? What right to play does does that uh, network operator have in the in the vertical they might have chosen? Well, in yeah. some cases, a tremendous amount. If you're Verizon and you've spent best part of three billion dollars on uh, fleet management and associated companies. Do you have a right to play in the fleet management space? Absolutely, you you do. 
so you can buy your, your way into these these spaces mm. there's also a set of uh, applications or maybe even uh, user types that are underserved or where there's not a solution that's designed specifically for them i'm thinking particularly around uh, smb okay and often the iot the, the, those solutions that are in the market and and there and ready to go are focused more at the high end of the market so is there an opportunity at the low end of the market for things like fleet management or tracking or that kind of thing well yes also also potentially so there are some areas that that the network operators might have a right to play in either because they have bought their way into the market or because there's not really sure. any incumbent player that's established themselves in that space but our general message is be beware be very okay. careful about about gotcha. trying to to do that move up the stack but uh, one, one one further final thought on that though the um it, it you don't have to go ho the whole hog and be the actual solution provider to have some kind of value coming from being a bit more vertical and and yeah. i think because the buyers of uh, iot tend to be vertical in fact they, all iot is vertical really in fact most companies that buy iot don't even think of themselves as buying iot they're buying fleet management or they're buying a smart metering solution or or, or whatever and and that being the the case you have to position it appropriately for the for the for the verticals and and adding this contextualization there kind of understanding the the ins and outs of how the the fleet space might work mm. or the utility space might work or, or whatever there's there's a lot of value with with that but ostensibly it's still selling a, a horizontal solution but it's understanding the the, the verticals right. And and that will be reflected in in these operators' marketing approaches as well. Yep. You know they'll they need to go out and position themselves, or they need to find. You know if you're looking at trade shows, right? You're probably going to go to a utilities trade show, or an um, electric vehicle charging trade show, or a healthcare trade show, rather than the generic horizontal IoT trade shows, and that because that's where you'll generally find your your customer base. Sure. And so. Um, both in terms of marketing and in terms of just meeting the needs of the of, of, of the customers, there has to be that sort of vertical element. But it's it's a it's an order of magnitude removed from actually putting in place a full end to end stack solution. Fantastic. Um, so I wanted to ask you, kind of before we wrap up here, just as we look into the rest of 2023 and beyond, um, what are some of the kind of best practices, strategies, just things you're kind of looking to see or expect to see kind of happening um, in this area of the IoT space kind of going forward? Broadly or specifically on the connectivity side of things, maybe we'll keep it, maybe we'll keep it tight, tightly um, tight yeah, sure. focused on the, on, on the connectivity yeah, let's uh, do that. landscape. Uh, yeah, it's, well, it's a lot of those things that I've mentioned already. It's, it's more focused on the, um, the sort of, almost ver verticalization but without getting into vertical solutions it's more integration of the various different uh, elements of the the proposition so the connectivity providers are also you know, they've got a bit of a device play and a bit of a security play and and uh, looking at compliance and looking at these these various other other, other areas i think we'll see um something of a of a shake out in terms of a really a much better understanding of how everybody is going to handle this multi-country connectivity how you how you deploy and support that uh, i think we we're now uh, in a position where uh, mbiot and ltm particularly ltm uh, i think will will bubble up to the surface as being the the technology of choice there's there's a lot of um we get insights into who, who's selling what and where and there are you know, a few operators who are selling, you know, forty percent of the connections they're selling are, are using LTEM. It's it's okay. looking like a looking like a, a winner for for sure. Uh, so there's a there's a few things like that. I don't I don't see there being a overwhelming overriding uh, theme uh, uh, beyond the, the those things that I've already uh, elaborated yeah. on. The network operators sure. finding their finding their home. The MVNOs being being increasingly uh, assertive. Some consolidation right. ha happening, and and, right. and all of these various various dynamics continuing uh, to play out. I think. 
Absolutely. No, this has been a incredible conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time. There's just the insights that not only, you know, you have, but the work you all have done, um, to collect those insights and really get a good grasp on what's going on and, and willingness to kind of share that with our audience is something that I, and I know our team and our audience is going to truly appreciate it. Appreciate. So, um, very exciting kind of space to follow for sure. Um, a lot is happening. Um, and you know, I really want to thank you again for taking the time to come on and, and talk with our audience about what, what you all have been doing and kind of what you're seeing in the market. Sure. My pleasure. Um, so for our audience who wants to kind of learn more about what you all have going on, check out um, reports that you do, stay in touch, kind of follow up in any capacity. What's the best way they can kind of do that and uh, learn more? Check out transformerinsights.com. So that's tra transform with an A, I should stress, transformerinsights.com. A couple of things to, to take a look at. So obviously there's a press release about the recent uh, CSP IoT peer benchmarking report. But we also did a webinar, which is accessible via the website for uh, anybody open open to anyone to to access okay. you'll need to you'll need to register on the site obviously but you can take a look at that where i talk for i mean we've talked for about half an hour on this stuff but i talk for a, an hour about more or less the key findings there i don't go into uh, who who the leading players are but certainly sure, I, I talk sure. about a lot of the same sort of themes so that's probably a good place to start in terms of what we do okay. and there'll be a bunch of stuff on our blog uh, in the next few weeks doubtless Fantastic. Well, Matt, thank you again so much. It's a pleasure to have you back and I look forward to, to finding other ways we can work together and uh, continue making content together. It's, it's been, it's been great. Absolutely.